All right, great. Um, okay, so hi everyone. To um, welcome back to data-driven methods in science and engineering seminar. So today we we're excited to have Professor Benjamin Perstorfer from the Kuran Institute of Mathematical Sciences. So uh, Professor Benjamin was a postdoctoral associate in aerospace and computational design uh, lab at the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, working with Professor Karen Wilcox. He received uh, his BS, MS, and PhD degrees from the Technical University of Munich, Germany in 20, uh, 2008, 2010, and 2013, respectively. Uh, his PhD thesis was uh, recognized with the uh, Heinz uh, Schwarzel Prize, uh, which uh, is jointly awarded by three German universities to an outstanding PhD thesis in computer science. And uh, Benjamin uh, was selected for a Department of Energy Early Career Award and the Ma Applied Mathematics Program in 2018 and for an Air Force Young Investigator Program Award in Computational Mathematics in 2020. In uh, 2021, Benjamin received a National Science Foundation Career Award in Computational Mathematics. His research focuses on computational methods for data and compute intensive science and engineering applications including scientific machine learning, mathematics of data science, model reduction, and computational statistics. So uh, we're very excited to have you, uh, Benjamin, with us today. And um, I'm looking forward for the talk. So um, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much for this uh, really nice introduction. And uh, especially thanks for the invitation. It's, it's great to be here and, and have this opportunity to present some of our research. So let me start by acknowledging um, two collaborators, Joan Brunner and Eric van den Eiden, who both are at Courant. And um, we have collaborated on one of the core pieces that I'm uh, going to present here today. Okay, let me start by um, the motivation. Why are we interested in quickly simulating transport dominated physical phenomena? And the reason for me is that I would like to solve outer loop applications. And in outer loop applications, we have a model um, that describes some, say, physical system, and we have um, an application that requires us to build a loop around that model so that we need to simulate the model for many different inputs to compute the corresponding outputs and iterate this maybe thousands, maybe tens of thousands, maybe even millions of times. We see this kind of outer loop applications um, almost everywhere in computational sciences and also in engineering. For example, think of PDE constraint optimization, where the model is the PDE and one has to numerically solve the PDE in each iteration step to, for example, find a descent direction. We have a similar situation in inverse problems, for example, Bayesian inverse problems, where there's the forward model and to draw samples from the posterior, one has to evaluate or, or simulate the forward model many times in a row for different inputs, different parameters, different coefficients. Uh, uncertainty quantification, where we have uh, an input distribution that we would like to propagate through the model to estimate some quantities of the corresponding output random variable. These are often Monte Carlo based methods where again, we need to simulate the model many times in a row for different um, inputs, different parameters and similar situations in visualization, multidisciplinary coupling control. So why are those outer loop applications challenging? Because if you think of classical um, numerical analysis, classical scientific computing, where we have an, a model, for example, coming from finite element analysis, then the runtime of an outer loop application looks something like this. We have here on the x axis the runtime, and we need to compute in each iteration of this outer loop application, for example, a solution Q at a time and some input mu one. And then we move to the second iteration, need to compute the Q at a certain time and a, a different input mu two, and then for mu three and mu four and so on. And for each of those iterations, we have to reserve a certain chunk of runtime to get the corresponding approximation based on this model. And these classical um, numerical uh, analysis or scientific computing models, so often they are based on virtual differential equations, they approximate the solution. The approximate solution here is Q at the spatial coordinate X in a, in a domain, time t and, a, and an input to a parameter mu, they are, um, derive approximations in spaces typically, which means there is a basis, basis functions phi, 
that depend on the spatial coordinates. And then there are coefficients that change with time and inward. And the corresponding approximation is a linear combination of this basis function with the corresponding coefficients. And these basis functions, they are typically obtained um, via some discretization, putting a lot of grid points in your spatial domain, for example, based on finite element uh, methods, finite volume methods, and one gets then an approximation space curly V that has a certain dimension capital M. And in each, in each of those iterations to co compute one Q for a different mu, one has to solve for the corresponding coefficients of that linear combination. And since N, um, the dimension of these say finite element spaces is usually high, um, this is typically too, too expensive to really just plug this into your favorite outer loop application and, and do that in a, in a tra tractable amount of time. So this is where surrogate models come into play. And surrogate models, one changes the way to, to approach these outer loop applications by splitting the computational time into two phases. The first phase is the training phase, a one-time high cost um, um, uh, evaluation, uh, sorry, a, a one-time high cost training phase where one generates, for example, data from this expensive model, extracts some um, patterns that are important in that data, and then derives uh, a cheaply to evaluate surrogate model. And this is all done once and for all in this, in this training phase. And then online, one uses the surrogate model to very quickly make predictions how these solutions look like. One does not get exactly the same, but an approximation, say Q tilde here, but one can much quicker predict um, or get a, a good approximation of, uh, of this high fidelity model um, states. So this is the idea of surrogate modeling, having this training phase, a one-time high cost to learn a model, and then an evaluation phase where one can very quickly predict um, corresponding solutions. Okay. So there are multiple types of, of surrogate models, and I like to distinguish three different types of surrogate models. The first one are simplified surrogate models. For example, if you again say that your model that you want to simulate is, is uh, based on a, on a PDE, then one could discretize that PDE on a coarser grid. Or if there's an iterative method um, hidden on when one uh, obtains the the numerical solution to the BDE, for example, a Newton solve or some um, iterative linear solve, one could simply stop that early. And this reduces the runtime, at the same time increases the error, but one could see those kind of things already as some kind of surrogate model. The second type are data fit surrogate models that just view the input output map from the mu's to the outputs um, as, a, as a black box and try to fit some parametrization, some model to that input output map. This could be a neural network regression. It could be classical response surfaces in, in very low dimensions, um, support vector regression, Gaussian process regression. So all these black box, if one does this in a black box, purely data-driven way, um, one gets, uh, for example, a data fit surrogate model. And then the third type are projection-based reduced models. And those in some sense um, combine um, both worlds here. Here we have a purely physics-based world that does not use data. Here we have a purely data-driven world that only looks at data. And in projection-based reduced models, it combines both. First, from data, important dynamics are extracted based on, say, full model states that have been computed in that training phase. And then in the evaluation phase, one does not only rely on data, but rather still goes back to the governing equation, wants to solve them numerically, but in now a data-informed parametrization that one has extracted or, or learned or at least informed by the data that one has, has, has sampled in the, in the training phase. And this is the spirit that, that we will follow here in the following. And of course, you are all very familiar with physics-based machine learning, so projection-based reduced models in some sense are a very early version of, of physics-based uh, machine learning. Okay, so how do these uh, typically work? Um, they try to identify latent dynamics. This is what I meant with important dynamics that uh, these uh, reduced models try to identify latent dynamics in the sense that if we look at a solution Q at a time um, T and, and an input mu, then um, one can think of this as a function in terms of X and look at the corresponding set of possible functions that one can reach over the parameter set or the input set and the, and the time range. 
And the idea of classical model reduction, these classical projection-based reduced models is that these solutions are not scattered all over the high dimensional solution space, curly V here, think of again, finite element space, but that they form smooth and very low dimensional manifolds. And if you um, are more coming from linear algebra perspective, then empirically one could observe such a smooth and very low dimensional manifold by, for example, looking at snapshots. So the, the coefficients of these approximations for certain times and inputs and, puts, and one can put those as columns into a matrix and look at how quickly the singular values decay. Um, this then, if one samples right, gives at least an indication that there exists a low dimensional space that well approximates the columns of this snapshot matrix. So this is the notion, this is the idea of classical model reduction really, where then in the training phase, one constructs this much lower dimensional space curly V little n, where little n is much smaller than capital N, capital N, think of finite element uh, space dimension. And this is this uh, low dimensional, uh, the, 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 sorry, the dimension of the low dimensional space. This is trained or constructed um, in the training phase once and for all. And then in the evaluation phase, one tries to find an approximation now of the, of the solution from the finite element space, one tries to find an approximation in this much lower dimensional space, curly V little n. And if the dimension um, curly V little n is much smaller than the dimension of the finite element space, if one can choose it that way, then um, one can uh, achieve really fantastic speed ups with these kind of um, classical model reduction methods. And I'm just listing here a few survey papers on that, on that topic. Okay, let's have a look at uh, a toy example. This is the heat equation. I'm skipping all the, all the details here. Just think of a diffusive process where we have here time and here spatial domain. So it's heat equation just 1D. And you can see here the, the diffusive process. And on, on the um, right plot here, I'm showing the index versus the singular value of the corresponding snapshot matrix. So I've collected states over time and computed now the singular values of the corresponding snapshot matrix. And you can see the singular values decay here. It seems fairly quickly with maybe 20 or so um, modes, we can up to machine precision describe at least the data that we have sent. Let's now have a look at another example, which is a linear advection equation. So pure transport where we have here again, time versus the spatial domain. And we start with um, a, a Gaussian bump as initial condition. And the only thing that this linear advection equation does, it transports this, this Gaussian bump through the spatial domain over time and here even with a constant speed. And if we now look at the singular values of the corresponding snapshots, then we can see here again, index or number of modes versus the singular value, a much slower decay of the corresponding singular value. So this already indicates that going from diffusion to transport, there really um, seems to flip something that makes it much harder to find a low dimensional space that makes it much harder to, for this um, classical model reduction methods to work well in these transport dominated regimes. Okay, these are of course two examples. I just want to point out one real world example that came as, a, as, a, as an application this Air Force Center for Multifidelity Modeling of Rocket Combustion Dynamics. That is a joint um, center by um, AFRL and AFOSR, um, U Michigan, the Odin Institute, uh, University of Kansas, Purdue, and, and also us uh, involved in that. And in that center, there's um, an interest, for example, in um, combustion engines, where um, this is a single injector combustion engine of a liquid fueled rocket engine. So one part of that, of that engine. And what I'm showing you here is the pressure in the, how it evolves in that, in that um, combustion chamber. And you can see that there is a, a wave traveling through the domain. So again, there's transport happening here. And this is what makes this kind of application um, hard for, for traditional classical model reduction. And what engineers would like to have in that setting is that they can very quickly predict the amplitude of this pressure waves and how it develops over time. And I'm showing this here, time versus the pressure. And this is the, this is the amplitude, how it increases. And one would like to find a design, and this is the outer loop application, 
try to find a design, a length of the combustion chamber or some other um, properties that one can change, would like to find a design such that this um, growth uh, is bounded so that at some point it enters the limit cycle and the, and the process is stable. Otherwise it blows up and, and explodes. Okay, so this is just a, a, a motivation that we see um, that there is a fundamental difference for model reduction, whether we look at a diffusive process or a transport dominated process, and that we see this kind of behavior in, in real world applications, for example, in these, in these combustion um, problems. So this is something to, to think about now, and um, this motivates the, the following work. I, I will first talk a little bit more about the formalities. What does this exactly mean now in terms of, of model reduction? How can we describe this behavior mathematically that there's a difference between diffusion and, and transport and what could we do about this? And then this is the, the collaboration with um, Sean Brun and Eric van den Eyden. We have one, we want to propose one idea of how to um, use the networks in a, in a specific way to address this Kolmogorov barrier, this, this issue that um, classical model reduction does not work well for transport dominated problems. And then I will have some numerical experiments to, um, to showcase that approach. All right, so let's dive in um, into uh, describing a little bit more in detail what it means that classical model reduction cannot be applied. And for this, we need to understand the properties of the solution manifold. And I said, it is the set of all these cues that we can reach over time and different inputs based on the, on the PDE that we would like to solve. And one measure to understand in some sense, the difficulty of this, of approximating elements of this curly M is the Kolmogorov N width. And there are multiple versions of the Kolmogorov N width. I'm showing just one of them here, uh, this D little m m where this little n is the dimension of the space. And this Kolmogorov n width tells us this is the best we can achieve. This is the best case error over all elements that we can achieve with an n-dimensional subspace of this high dimensional space curly V. So picking the best space, best subspace of dimension n, and, and then the, the worst element that maximizes the error, this is, this is the error that this space achieves. So there, if uh, there's no other space that, uh, if we have a space that achieves this dn um, m, this, this n width, then there cannot exist another space that um, achieves anything better. In other, in other words, if this Kolmogorov n width decays slowly with the dimension n, or it decays quickly with the dimension n, it means we can either not find good spaces or we can find good spaces. And there are some limited results on when the Kolmogorov n width decays quickly. Here's an early result from 2002, but there are newer ones that are more general, but for some specific setups, for example, here, a single parameter symmetric recursive elliptic PDE it has been shown by Made, Batera and, and collaborators in 2002 that the cor corresponding Kolmogorov N with decays exponentially. And this is what, what typically we want to see in classical model reduction and exponential decay as we increase the dimension of our subspace. And this, a space that it achieves such an exponential decay can also be found with freedom methods, which has been um, another um, result uh, a few years ago. So to summarize, roughly speaking, we see a fast exponential decay of the Kolmogorov N width for diffusion dominated problems. And this agrees with our numerical observation that we had earlier that where we looked just at the singular values and said, well, they are decaying um, um, fast here. Clearly, singular values decay does not directly say anything about the n width, but it at least gives us a numerical indication. Now, on the other hand, we looked at a transport problem. So here, linear advection. Um, this is the linear advection equation with a speed mu here and, and some boundary condition. And the initial condition is a step. And you can see the only thing that's happening here is over the spatial domain. This step is just transported to the right with constant speed. And in 2016, Olberg and Rave have shown that the corresponding n width of that solution manifold cannot decay faster than one over square root n. So going from the exponential decay that we see in these diffusion dominated problems to not faster than one over square root n for this transport dominated problem. And this is the Monte Carlo rate. So typically this is way too slow to be worth 
to have this offline phase of finding a space and then um, solving that. And similar results have been shown for um, other transport dominated equations, for example, wave equation by Greif and Urban in, in 2020. Okay, so this, this just formalizes that we can, based on the Kolmogorov N with, um, distinguish between two cases. The, the first case problems where there's a fast decay and then these classical model reduction methods work well. And then um, problems where there's a slower decay and then we know there cannot exist a classical, um, uh, a classical model reduction method that does well because there simply is no space. There, this, this is good and bad news. Um, it is bad news in the sense that these classical model reduction methods do not work in that case, but it's also good news in the sense that the Kolmogorov N with only applies to these linear approximations that classical model reduction methods um, do. Namely these approximations in spaces where one has basis functions that are independent of say time and parameter or time and in inputs, they are fixed, computed once and for all, and then one has these coefficients to form these linear combinations. We can really think of this as linear models. If we think of the coefficient vector here, we can compute the inner product e transpose of this of the spaces. And uh, what I mathematically mean by linear, besides this, this, this scalar product, is that this function space in which one derives approximation, this low dimensional space in classical model reduction, is independent of the element um, that one wants to approximate. So one way out, and you can see this already is going towards nonlinear approximations. And one step is localized model reduction. In localized model reduction, one pre-computes multiple spaces. So curly Vn1 to Vnj, where each of those spaces is spanned by a different um, set of basis functions. And then based for example on time and parameter, one selects a different space online in the evaluation phase while one solves the outer loop application, depending um, on, on certain properties that one sees in the solution. And I'm just giving here as an example based on time and, and input. So the approximation now, Q tilde, is, um, depends on the, or the, the space in, one, in which one approximates depends on time and the parameter. And in, in that sense, it's a, it's a non-linear approximation because now the uh, approximation space changes depending on which kind of element I would like to approximate. And these kind of localized model reduction uh, methods have been investigated um, in, in the last 10 years or so quite extensively. And they are also closer related to dictionary approaches in compressed sensing, um, where you have a large dictionary and you want to pick a few elements that will well approximate your behavior. And of course, Nathan and Steve are experts in, in, in that setting. I'm just listing here the, the model reduction literature. Okay, so then moving from localized model reduction um, to adaptive model reduction, where one says, I would not like to pre-compute um, multiple spaces, but I would like to change my space as I go. So making the space curly VN depend on time and the input and corresponding it is the, the basis depends on time and input. And then one has to do two things in the online phase or in the evaluation phase. One first has to approximate or find an approximation in that, um, in that basis that changes with time and parameter. But then also one has to evolve the basis forward in time during the evaluation phase. So finding an update to the basis functions as one moves forward in time. So evolving the basis. And there really the challenge is to do this efficiently and in a stable way. And there has been also quite a lot of work in, in that direction, for example, dynamic low, low rank approximations um, by various people, um, um, subsys, for example, here. There have been, we have done some work on adaptation from sparse samples, looking only at the few samples of the solution and so advancing the, uh, evolving the basis. Um, Kevin Kalberg has done work on enriching subspaces via an age adaptivity, for example. Um, as well. Okay, so we have seen linear approximations, localized, um, adaptive. Now, the next step in some sense is abstracting away from time and, and input here, um, allowing the space to not only change with time and, and parameter, but making this a little bit more abstract by just saying we would like that um, our space in which we approximate or 
uh, yeah, our space in which we approximate depends on some feature vector alpha. And then our approximation depends on beta and alpha and beta is the, is the linear coefficient that enters in this linear combination and alpha decides how to change the, the representation. And, and there you already can see where this is going. Of course, this is going now towards deep neural networks where one changes the representation in which one wants to approximate the corresponding solution. One learns the features on the way. And this has of course seen um, a very active uh, research over the last uh, several years. And, and, and just listing here three key questions, how to parameterize, so how to choose this, how the, the, the phi depends on alpha. You can think of what architecture to choose in some sense. What is the best approximation area that one can achieve? We have seen for linear approximations, there's the Kolmogorov n width, and if one can upper or lower bound this, one knows the best one can achieve, or at least in, a, in asymptotic and in a bound, and in a bound way. And then um, the, the numeric side, how can we now build numerically efficient solvers based on parameterizations that look like this? So where we have this linear coefficient beta and a feature vector that enters in some sense, the basis function that changes the, the space as we move forward. And there's no way anymore to, to really list a comprehensive um, set of, of works in that direction. So I'm just calling out here a few um, um, highly visible works from the last several years by, of course, um, Nathan and, and, and Steve, but also by Wijnan Er and um, Lars Rudotto, uh, and of course, also the work by um, Paris and Kaniatakis on, on physics-informed um, neural networks. Okay, so we are faced now with this situation and, and I, it was a little bit a lengthy introduction, but I really wanted to motivate why we need to look at um, nonlinear approximations like this. So if, if we solve these classical diffusion-based um, um, problems, then I, and they are in lower dimensions, then there's based on the Kolmogorov not really much use of going to a neural network. But if one has this transport dominated behavior, then we know that um, spaces are not enough and we need a nonlinear approximation. The question now for us and the following is, how can we build a numerically efficient solver based on this parameterization? How does this compare to other works that are, that are out there? All right, so this brings me now to the, to the core of, the, of what I would like to talk about, this neural local working method. Um, as I said, which is a collaborative work with uh, Shuan Bruner and Derek van den Eide, both at Courant. Just checking here. Um, okay. All right. Um, so what is the setup? Um, we have a time-dependent PDE. Um, here's the time derivative. We have uh, Q as our still our solution that depends on time and X. And I have a right-hand side function F here um, that again depends on time, on X, and the solution. We assume in the following, we have suitable boundary conditions for this and then suitable initial conditions. And I skip the, the input here for now. There's no parameter mu. I will come back to that a little bit later. For now, there's no parameter mu. And, and the only question that we're asking is, um, we would like to numerically solve such a time dependent PE or such an evolution equation. Now we parameterize this. So we take the solution Q at the time, which is then a function in X and it's in some space, curly V. This could be a, a very high dimensional space. And then we would like to parameterize this with some theta that depends on time so that we can equivalently write Q of theta time and, and X. So this is an equivalence. There's no approximation at this point. This could be infinitely many parameters for now. This could be a function that changes with time and is in some space um, theta. The key that we, that we want to achieve, of course, in the following is that we have a nonlinear, or that we allow a nonlinear parameterization. So this theta t can enter nonlinearly into Q. And if this is a, a finite dimensional parameterization, then this theta, and you can think of this theta t as being a vector of, for example, weights in your, in your deep network parameterization. But I want to point out that um, deep networks are one kind of nonlinear parameterization that that is compatible with, with what I'm going to present. Okay, the question is now, how are these um, parameters theta found? And one of the widely used approaches is learning these parameters via collocation. This is, for example, done by the DGM method or by the physics-informed neural networks. 
and, and, and variants of, of those, um, those works. The idea there is to draw samples T and X over this time space domain, and then fit the parameter theta based on minimizing the residual at those sample points or those collocation points. So I call this a collocation approach because you draw many samples and then you evaluate the residual at those samples. And so you adapt your parameter, you fit your parameter based, for example, on some optimization, some SGD approach. And I want to point out that this parameter is really the parameter of representing the solution. So we are not trying to learn the equation or things like this, which is also done quite a lot with, with deep neural networks. We are really want to approximate the solution. We have given the PDE and I would like to solve. Okay, so we are interested in transport dominated problems, as I said, and in transport dominated problems, we often have local features that travel over time. For example, here we have the spatial domain versus time. And there's again, this, this Gaussian bump that then travels through this spatial domain to the left over time. If you now think of these classical collocation methods, then what one has to do is to sample the time and, and space domain, which is just two dimensional because we just have a one dimensional spatial domain. But already in two dimension, you can think it is quite challenging based on purely on sampling to even find this very local feature that changes over time, that evolves over time. And most of this space, actually nothing is happening. So one really has to extensively sample this time spatial domain to, um, to find where the residual is, is not zero and to adapt uh, or fit the parameters um, of, the, of the parametrization accordingly with collocation methods. And you can imagine that if you go to higher dimensions, this gets, of course, exponentially more difficult um, because if you are in higher dimensions and you have one local feature that, that moves over time, you have to extensively sample that domain to find that feature. And this is something that we would like to address with this neural Galerkin idea. There we say, we aim to find a solution by imposing now dynamics on this parameter theta t, rather than trying to discover via optimization where things are happening and then fitting the parameter based on collocation points. So we now really would like to derive an equation of how this theta t evolves over time, how they say, weights of the, of the neural network evolve over time and the dynamics are given by the PDE that we, are, that we want to solve. Okay, so how are we doing that? Um, let's first look at the residual function. Um, we take the, the, the time derivative chain rule here, we get the residual R that depends on theta and then, and then eta and the, and the spatial coordinate X of course. And um, this, is, this is the residual, this is the time derivative, this is the right hand side. And then we have an objective function. And now this objective function depends on time t. So this is not a time space approach anymore um, where we sample over time and space, but the objective depends on time t and changes with time t. This objective um, there enters theta and, and eta. And then we have here the, the, the residual squared and uh, a regularization to, to avoid an unbounded growth of the, of the parameters, for example. Now, one key aspect is how we are doing, how we are formulating this, this integral here, namely via a measure nu t that depends on time. So um, the, 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 the objective is time dependent and it is time dependent also because the measure nu t, uh, sorry, nu t with which we compute this integral here depends on time. And boundary conditions can be imposed then either via um, a penalty terms were encoded directly in the parametrization. Okay, so having this um, time dependent um, uh, objective now, we would like to minimize it over all times. Um, we would like to find a theta dot t that minimizes the corresponding objective at time t. And this now um, means that we, for example, want to uh, set the corresponding gradient of this objective to zero. And that leads to the Euler Lagrange equation, but simply the gradient setting it to zero. And you can see what enters here is the theta dot coming from the chain rule and the theta itself. So if, we, if one looks at that more carefully, one can see that this equation now is an ODE that describes how the theta, how the parameters of the network um, evolve over time 
if we want to solve the corresponding PDE in a, in a variational sense. So this, this kind of um, ODE where we have here an M, an, an operator M that depends on time and the theta T, and we have a right-hand side capital F that also depends on time and the theta T, this, this system of ODEs imposes this dynamics on the, on the parameters theta so that the corresponding nonlinear parameterization Q of theta T solves the PDE in a variational sense. So this is again different from um, collocation where one tries to minimize the, the empirical loss and so finds how to change the parameters over time. All right. Good. How do these operators now, um, how do they look like? Um, I'm just writing them down, down here. We have this M and we have an F. The M both depend on time and this parameter. And you can see here, the, the again, the mesh new T showing up. So this M changes um, with, with time and also the way we can compute it or estimate it later on will change with this mesh new T will change with time T. And the same for, for the F. What does this mean? If we now have um, a finite dimensional approximation, just for a moment, um, we can interpret this M and F. If we have a parameterization that looks like this, which is uh, written in a general way, um, we have a Q that now depends on this vector theta um, and time T. And then we have here a linear output layer depending on this coefficient C. And then we have here some channel um, and that depends on, on again, features C. If we have a parameterization like this, then the corresponding M and F um, uh, are operators that correspond to Golurkin projection. This, this um, uh, explains the name neural Golurkin because we have a Golurkin projection here with respect to uh, a test uh, space that is spanned by this phi's and um, that is spanned by the C times the gradients of these phi's. And these phi's, they change based on the, on the features. And, and we have, here we have the residual. And again, you can see here the time dependent measure. So we have here n plus np equations in n plus np unknowns. So one can explain where this is coming from even via a Golurkin projection. Okay, so what do we do now with this um, ODE? We now um, have turned solving the, um, the PDE in this nonlinear parameterization we have turned that into integrating an ODE. And in principle, we now could um, pick any classical time integration scheme and apply it to that system of ODEs and integrate it forward in time. And just, uh, just one comment that this work by, by Wein and Ern and collaborators, um, they also have not only a collocation approach, but they also have some discretization in time in a very special case where then also the number of layers increases with time. This is not the case here, um, this parameters uh, whatever, how, how, how um, independent of how many um, layers you have, you have different um, time steps here, or you can integrate it forward in time with different time discretization schemes. Okay, why is this now critical for us? Because um, we can, for example, now choose a time depend, uh, um, sorry, we, I, we can now choose a time step size that depends on time. So at delta TK, we have your time discretization and the time step size can change with time. And think again of our um, transport dominated problems. It's, it's really important there that for example, depending on how the, how the dynamics evolve, we might want to have um, smaller or, or larger time steps, just as in classical numerical integration where we also have, for example, Lunge Kutte four or five schemes that adaptively choose how you move forward in time. This is hard to do with the collocation approach where you have a time space and you just sample over it. And I denote in the following now, this approximations of the parameter at time TK with a theta K. So we can discretize the corresponding ODE now in, in essentially two different ways. The first one is explicit, the other one is implicit. And both it, it's compatible with both these um, um, both uh, types of schemes. For example, if you have an explicit runge kutte scheme, then in each um, time step, we have to solve such a system here where you see M depends on the previous time step and the parameter at the previous time steps. And also F depends on the um, parameters of the previous time steps, it's an explicit scheme. So in each iteration, in each time iteration, we now have to only solve 
a linear regression problem. It's only a linear solve for a linear regression problem in each time iteration um, to, to move forward these parameters. If you do an implicit discretization in time, then we get, a, 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 for example, something like this. This is um, implicit Euler. Um, we are now this M and F, they depend now on the current time step, on theta k, the theta k that we would like to find. And there now we get um, uh, nonlinear systems that we have to solve and non-convex problem that, for example, we have to solve in each time step with, um, for example, SGD. What we have done was that we looked at the con time continuous problem, derived the optimization problem, and then discretized. We could also turn this around and first discretize and then derive the corresponding um, uh, the, the gradient that we want to set to zero. We are working in, in that direction as well um, to understand what the benefits and traits of some of these two approaches. All right, so the final piece that is missing now is how do we get this M and F? Um, and of course we cannot um, analytically compute those in, in general cases. So we have to resort to some estimation or approximation. And the uh, natural thing is to do Monte Carlo to replace M and F with Monte Carlo estimates of M tilde and F tilde. This is also very similar to what one does in, 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 uh, re by replacing the population loss with the empirical loss, for example. So one gets then an estimator M tilde that depends on the number of samples M that we want to afford to estimate that M. And the key thing is that these samples are now drawn from this time dependent measure nu T. So we draw samples from nu T, X1, TK to X M TK, and then form, for example, this, this Monte Carlo estimator and in a similar fashion for F tilde. Now, because in each time step, we, we can change this measure nu t, we can also change the way we sample. And, and this is going back to this idea earlier that I mentioned where I said we have this local dynamics and we, we don't want to discover them by just purely um, sampling in, a, in an oblivious way, but we would like to track them um, in, in, a, in, a, in a more adaptive fashion. We can do this now by changing this measure nu t, um, for example, by sampling proportional to the solution of the previous time step squared. And a careful choice of the units of the parameterization will um, in the numerical results greatly help us to, to a simplify that adaptive sampling. If we change the way we sample data during, during time integration. So to summarize, this neural Golurkin approach is adaptive in time in the sense that we can choose adaptively time step sizes and so can make larger time steps where possible, but uh, can resort to smaller time steps in a dynamic fashion where necessary. And it is adaptive in terms of the sampling so that we approximate or estimate this M and F operators depending on how the solution changes over time. Okay, so this brings me now to the numerical um, experiments um, to show this method on, on a few examples. And the first one is um, a really classical benchmark called the vector freeze equation KDV, where we have here a third order um, derivative and we have here a, a nonlinear term. This is just 1D. So I'm, I'm skipping the adaptive sampling for these 1D examples here. I have higher dimensional examples later on. We have periodic boundary conditions. We use an adaptive time integration scheme, Runge equal to four or five and just a uniform sampling. Again, it's, it's one dimensional, so the sampling doesn't really pay off that. It's, it's more important in higher dimensions. And then we discretize this just with a shallow network based on exponential units that are, that are periodic to, to enforce that periodic boundary condition. You can see how the solution changes over time here in the, in the right plot. This is the result that we get. This is the truth. We have an analytic solution for that setup, spatial domain versus time of the truth. This is linear Galerkin, so having basis functions fixed at an equidistant grid, um, spatial domain versus time, and you can clearly see it's not very well approximated. And then we have neural Galerkin um, that has the same number degrees of freedom as this linear Galerkin, fewer nodes, but same number of degrees of freedom, time versus spatial domain, which more accurately approximates the truth than the, than the linear Galerkin. Uh, another 1D example that I wanted to show is the Allen Kahn equation, um, where we have a quartic potential and where we have a time and space varying coefficient. And you can see the solution here, spatial domain versus, versus the solution. And it, it forms these two states 
um, over time. And because we have this time dependent and spatially dependent coefficient, it's, it's a little bit um, more tricky to form those, those um, two steady states than, than in classical settings. Here we use a backward Euler time discretization and again, uniform sampling because it's just 1D and we use a deep network with, with multiple layers and, and 10 H units where we make the input layer again periodic by uh, composing it with the sign. These are the results that we get. This is linear Galerkin and this is neural Galerkin. And you can see linear Galerkin, same number of degrees of freedom, cannot really predict the, the right steady states. Uh, the, the neural Galerkin does what it, what it, how the solution should actually look like. It, it evolves into two steady states here, one in the gray, one in the red, whereas the linear Galerkin fails to do that and has still uh, um, this, this kind of um, intermediate state there. I'm also showing you here some relative error of the state versus time. Um, blue is, is um, linear Galerkin. Um, orange is neural Galerkin with just a Gaussian units and, and a shallow network. And green is neural Galerkin with 10 H units and, and three layers, which achieves about two orders of magnitude improvement for the same, roughly the same number of degrees of freedom than, than linear Galerkin. Now, I said we impose dynamics on the coefficients and on the features, um, how they move forward in time. And I want to show that here. This is linear Galerkin. This is time versus the, the coefficient that, that enters linearly and time versus the feature. In that case, it's just the position of the units which are fixed. They don't change over time and they're equidistantly um, set. Um, in neural Galerkin, we just have two units, two nodes, um, and the corresponding coefficients change with time, but also the features evolve. And this, this, this dynamics that are imposed, they are based on this, um, on this Galerkin projection scheme that I, that I mentioned earlier. Okay, now to, to the... Um, more interesting examples, higher dimensional transport. This is really where, where we want to um, um, be at. We have here a high dimensional advection equation. High dimension means here only dimension five, but it's already quite challenging there in my opinion, because if you look at the marginals in dimension one, two, three, four, five, you can see very local dynamics um, in this high dimensional five dimensional space that, um, that uh, these local features that evolve over time with different speeds, and that have different shapes um, um, uh, in, in, in the dimension. We use here runge the 4-5 for the time discretization scheme. And um, we would like to avoid having to uniformly sample this high dimensional space to, to discover these features, but rather would like to track them. Now, how do we do the adaptive sampling in this case? It is based on the units that we choose and we make our life here a little bit easier and say we just have exponential units in our network. And then we can um, uh, choose the time dependent mesh and mu t um, proportional to simply the mixture of those units, of those nodes. And, and because the features of those nodes change over time, also so does the, the mesh over time. And then we can sample from this new T in each time step and so estimate our M and F operators. And these are the results. On the top row, you can see the truth. We have a, an, an analytic solution in that case. On the middle row, you can see uniform sampling and you can see nothing is happening there. It simply cannot discover these, these very local structures with just a thousand samples in this five dimensional space. And the last row is the adaptive neural Galerkin approach where you can see it tracks these local features and only a thousand samples are sufficient because we adaptively sample in the, in the right places based on this time adaptive mesh in UT. All right, I'm seeing I'm starting to run out of time. So last example is a particle trap. This is eight dimensional where we have eight particles that are, in, that are attracted to a trap. I'm showing here particle one versus four versus eight, the position of those particles and you can see that they are approaching this this trap and then get trapped there and, and, and start to oscillate. This is the positions of these particles is governed by an STE and the corresponding density is d-dimensional and it is um, um, the, it is described by a Fokker Planck equation. And you can again expect here that we have local features in high dimensional spaces because the the particle density concentrates over time as these particles get trapped. And this is really hard to track with just a, a, an, an uninformed sampling 
um, in, in, in a general case. These are the results that we get. So these are, are three projections here, particle one, four, eight, one, two, three, six, seven, eight. And I'm showing in black the, the, the mean of the, of the particles that we can compute here um, based, based on other methods. And in orange, I can show, that I, I do show that the neural lurking approach based on adaptive sampling. And in blue, I'm showing neural lurking based on just the uniform sampling. And you can again see that the adaptive sampling really is key here with a thousand samples per time step. We can very accurately track these particles and, and how they will move. And you can see quite different dynamics um, depending on what kind of um, projection you are looking at. Whereas in all those cases, pure uniform sampling simply fails to, to discover those dynamics and so cannot really um, well approximate the corresponding um, particles. I also want to show some error plots. This is the mean of the particle, the relative error for the mean. And this is the relative error for the covariance of the corresponding density. In orange, this is neural lurking based on our adaptive sampling. Um, the mean is approximated with about a relative error of 10 to the minus three. And blue shows the um, neural lurking with just a uniform sampling. So which, would, uh, which, which one would have if um, for example, just samples a time-space domain. And there you can see it, it approximates very poorly the actual mean that the errors go way beyond one and this is a relative error. For the covariance, I'm not even showing what uniform sampling gives because it would um, distort the scale here, but I, I show what um, the adaptive neural lurking gives. And you can see for off-diagonal elements, we get about 10 to the minus one in accuracy for this um, uh, covariance matrix. And for the diagonal elements, we get about 10 to the minus two relative accuracy um, for the covariance. All right, so that brings me um, to the conclusions. Um, the takeaway message I think is that we need nonlinear parametrizations for efficiently approximating transport dominated problems, especially if you're interested in outer loop applications, we would like to find low dimensional latent dynamics that we can quickly approximate. This led to the question, how should we do that numerically? We can, of course, use a, a nonlinear parametrization such, such as a deep network, but then the question is how to solve for the corresponding parameters and features over time. And what we propose is to impose dynamics on those parameters that are induced by the PDE, and so then integrate those forward in time, rather than trying to discover via sampling and collocation where the residual is high and, and trying to reduce the residual corresponding. And this adaptive sampling really is key, um, especially in higher dimensions. Um, as for example, in this particle approach where features are local and where we don't really have much hope to, to approximate those um, um, by just discovering through sample. Next steps are clearly to connect this back to the outer loop application and the model reduction ideas. But um, I can mention that we will have a preprint hopefully out on that um, fairly soon, the next um, two weeks on this neural lurking approach. If you're interested more generally in, in nonlinear model reduction, there will be an upcoming more educational article on the notices of the American Mathematical Society in 2022. And um, we also have some other work on nonlinear model reduction methods based on adaptive spaces. And with that, thanks for your attention. And I'm, I'm uh, happy to take questions, comments. Thank you very much for this amazing talk. So um, now we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, there's already an, a question in the chat, which I'll ask yeah. in, in slide 12, uh, does the same hold for a multilinear approximation? Multi-index in some, I think. Um, uh, 12. Um, multilinear, multi-index sum. Um, so if, if this is referring to tensor-like approximations, then, then I would say no, because there you have a nonlinear um, composition in between. So there you are um, uh, more in the, in the nonlinear approximation type already, adaptive model reduction maybe. Uh, um, so if anyone has any questions, you can... Um... Raise your hand and we can unmute you or just uh, write it in chat. Um, so just uh, from uh, Jijun, um, just a quick question. Uh, did you do Kamasa-Holm equation? 
Um, we did not do that equation. We, we tried a few other ones um, just internally to make sure everything is working well, but um, we have not tried that particular one, um, but it, it sounds interesting. I will definitely look into it. Uh, yeah. uh, he's asking if he can unmute, I think. Yes. Um, can you raise your hand so that we can see you on the chat? Thanks. Yes. We can hear you now. Hi, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, George Chiao, Zhi Jin Chiao. I have a question regarding Kamasa home equation. I heard your answer. Well, thank you so much for addressing my question. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Kamasa home equation has peaked a solid tone. Uh, mm -hmm. So, if you have any computational skill to discretize uh, the Kamasa home equation, uh, let me know. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. We will definitely have a look. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, hey, Ben. Uh, I'll jump in since we don't have any talks in the chat. Uh, great talk. Um, the, I was just curious, uh, the transport equations that you were uh, approximating here have local features uh, and just a few of them. Uh, do you think your method has benefits when there's a lot of distributed local features like in a turbulent sort of model? Yeah, that, that's a really excellent question. So you can of course push this to the extreme and say you have um, in, in a classical sense, a wave at each grid point, right? Almost like um, Burkle lens, this, this randomization type behavior, then there's no way to, to really reduce that um, anymore, right? Because it's, it's randomized. So there has to be some structure and the structure that we are exploiting is that there's some look Locality. Um, it depends though what locality means, right? Um, here I, I focused more on the spatial locality, but you could also have locality in some other sense that with the right units, with the right parameterization, you could exploit in a similar setting. So that's, that's a really excellent question. That's something that we are still trying to really um, get a, a mathematical grip on what, how we could formulate something like this. We had something like this would show up um, um, how this locality would play a role. That's great. Thanks, uh, thanks so much. Uh, so we have a question from Alexander, uh, just on Um Sorry. Yes. Uh, not anymore. So Alexander, you uh, want yes, to ask Benjamin, questions? thank you for a nice talk. Can I see your talk um, in the way that it's explained us why machine learning methods are successful um, in solving CFD problems or problem with turbulence? You see, you somehow that machine learning methods does uh, this nonlinear approximation for us. Can I see okay, it like I, this? I, I wouldn't say I have answered that grand that grand question, but for this specific um, uh, transport dominated problems, I think there one can say that linear approximation simply suffer from these slowly decay decaying Kolmogorov n rifts, and anything that's non-linear can in principle break that barrier. And I, from my perspective, from my limited perspective, of course, um, deep networks can help in that, in that situation um, because they adapt the, the feature representation. And that's really the key why for us in this setting, neural networks are, are I think, useful. But of yes, course, yes. there are many other situations where they are really excellent and that has nothing to do with, with this challenge that I'm describing here. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe one last question. Um, in the chat, there's, so similarly, for example, uh, stiff terms could be handled? Um, yeah, because you can change the time discretization schemes which which you want to integrate these parameters in time. And um, if you have a stiff source term, then most likely you need something implicit there. 
And uh, you can, we, we even used implicit methods um, in, in these numerical experiments. So um, there, the challenges are not going away of stiff problems. You still have them, but I think you can address them with maybe similar tools as in, in classical numerics, um, implicit methods, for example. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for answering questions. Thank you for this amazing talk. Uh, it was great having you. And uh, with this, we will conclude. Um, next week, we won't have a talk, but the week after. Um, so looking forward to discussing this with you again in the future. So thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you, Benjamin, for being with us. Thanks, thanks very much. Thank you. Great thank to you. see you. Good to see you. All right.